Hello, hello, hello. It's Carolyn Chapman, and I am excited about talking to you today about why bother interpreting your dreams. You know, because the reality is, and I've interpreted many dreams on this channel and for people in private sessions, the reality is it can be a bother to interpret a dream, but in my humble opinion, it's really worthwhile to bother interpreting your dreams because you can get some really valuable information from your dreams. And today I'm going to talk to you about a dream that actually ended up helping to save the lives of thousands of children that were born with a congenital heart defect called Blue Baby Syndrome. These are babies that were born with this heart defect and it made the, their skin blue. So they weren't like necessarily totally blue, but maybe around the eyes, the ends of their fingers. So I want to tell you about the story of how this dream was so important in saving these children's lives today. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, I'll take a look in the chat and see if there are questions. Now, I'm not going to interpret anyone's dream today, but if you have a question that would be uh, general for other people to understand, then I would be glad to answer it. So let's begin. Now, have you ever heard of Vivian Thomas? I hadn't either. And in fact, I would have never even known about Vivian Thomas, except for it was the movie shown on an airplane. Now, Vivian Thomas, by the way, is the guy who had this dream. And it was in the old days when you didn't have, you know, now you've got this little screen in front of you, which is on the back of the chair in front of you. And that's where the movies are, and you can choose which movie you want, or maybe a television program, or a series, a podcast, whatever. But in the olden days, when you got on a plane, that the, the videos, the movies were not right there in front of you. They were overhead in the aisle. And as after the plane was in the air, these... TV screen would fold down, and that's where the movie would be. And the only ch choice you had in those days was yes or no. Yes, I'll watch the video, I'll watch the movie, or no, I won't. Now, if you watched, wanted to watch the movie, you had to pay two dollars to buy these earphones, and they're very uncomfortable. They would clip over your ear like this. And because in those days I was doing a lot of traveling, um, speaking in various places, I was doing a lot of flying and I bought my earphones. It was before earbuds. And um, I would just keep them in my purse with me and then whatever movie was on, I was gonna watch it. Now this was a movie that I normally would never have watched because it was called Something the Lord Made. And it sounded like an overly religious kind of movie, but it wasn't at all. It was that this, this uh, operation that saved the children with the heart defect, it was actually the first operation ever performed on the heart. Until now, the heart was considered off limits. Nobody, no surgeons ever did any kind of operation involving the heart because, you know, the heart is beating and a person could die really easily with the, because you need to have the heart keep beating. Anyway, that's, I assume, why they never touched the heart before. But um, in any case, this research was headed by this Dr. Alfred Blaylock and I'm just going to check my notes here to make sure that I'm getting everything that I want to say. Um, so like I said, I'm going to tell you about this dream that was definitely worth interpreting. And um, 
it was Vivian Thomas's dream. Now, the thing is, I'd never heard of Vivian Thomas, like I said, and Vivian Thomas was actually one of these unsung heroes, and not just because of his dream. He has an amazing story. He, he, has, he is a role model to me because he had so many hardships to overcome, which he did in a very calm, caring way. And I gotta let you in on a secret about myself. This is a true confession. I like to feel sorry for myself. And one of the things I felt sorry for about myself was that I'm the first child born in our family and I'm a girl. And in our culture, a mother gets esteem if her first child is a boy. So the moment I was born, and it was before ultrasound, I was a disappointment. And I've felt sorry for myself about that and have spent time talking about it with people and all the rest of it. And my mother made it really clear that basically she didn't achieve esteem until my brother was born. And the unfortunate thing is my mother was a first child as well. So this was disgrace to my grandmother, disgrace to my mother. And I fortunately, my first child was a boy. And so I redeemed the whole family, the whole mothers there that had failed before me. And I'm telling you this story because Vivian Thomas, I don't know if you noticed, but Vivian is a girl's name. Most, some boys are named Vivian, but most of the time Vivian's a girl's name. And when people would say to Vivian Thomas, that's a girl's name, he would say, well, my mother wanted a girl, but she got me and she liked the name. So she gave me the name Vivian. And you know what? He did not spend his life feeling sorry for himself because he had a girl's name and because his mother had wanted a girl. So right there, he becomes a hero to me and a role model, someone that I can, that I want to be like him. Now, that's just the beginning of the problems he had. He was born in 1910. And that means that in 1929, he was 19 years old and ready to go to college. Now he came from a family of carpenters. His dad was a very skilled carpenter and he and his brothers were trained in the carpentry field. Um, I'm just gonna check my, um, oh, okay. It, I just wanted to see if someone was having trouble getting in on the call, and she is. <laughs> anyway, so he was trained to be a carpenter, and he was a very good carpenter because he was trained by his dad, who was a very good carpenter. However, he wanted to be a doctor, and he had to have a very good dad because the dad was okay with him being a doctor, and in fact, Vivian worked as a carpenter after school and in his summer holidays, once he was old enough to do that kind of work, and he saved all his money to become a doctor. However, in 1929, when he was ready to go to medical school, that is the date of the stock market crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. And all the money that Vivian Thomas had saved in the bank was gone. The bank failed and all the money, there was no money, it was gone. Now, here's a really good reason to feel sorry for himself. Did he? Well, I read about him in a book called Partners of the Heart. And in that book, he said that that day he was so angry that he couldn't even go to work. And he spent the whole day walking his anger off. I mean, there was nothing he could do. 
basically his future, his hopes, his dreams were gone. However, he consoled himself with the thought that, well, he could just keep working and eventually he would save some money. But it was the Great Depression and people were not building houses or renovating buildings. And many carpenters did not have work. And he was, he lost his job. He did not have a job. So now, not only had he lost all his money, but he couldn't earn any more money. And he was grateful to get any job that he could get. Somebody told him about a job that was available at Vanderbilt Research Hospital. And it was working for this doctor, Dr. Albert Blaylock. And Blaylock was evidently a pretty high strung person and very hard to satisfy. But Vivian Thomas had enough sense to realize that a job was a job and also it was in a hospital. <clears throat> so maybe he couldn't be a doctor, but maybe he could work in a hospital. And he took the job. But you know what his job was? In those days, they did research on dogs. They did their research surgeries on dogs. And those of you who are animal rights activists, I don't want you to get the backs all up about this. Back in the 1920s and 1930s, there was no neutering and spaying. And dogs were running wild in the streets and hundreds of thousands of them and they were hungry and scrawny and the SPCA was picking them up and euthanizing them, putting them to sleep. I mean, putting them to sleep sounds so sweet, but it meant just killing them. So in a way, the dogs that were used to research had it better than the other dogs. And part of Vivian Thomas's duties in his job was cleaning their cages and taking care of the dogs. That means dog poop, lots of dog poop. And as far as I can tell from watching that movie, also there's a PBS documentary called Partners of the Heart on YouTube. And I've put the links to both the movies down below in the description. As far as I can tell, Vivian did not feel sorry for himself for those reasons either. And um, I just have the utmost respect for him. Now, okay. <clears throat> the other thing now is, and, and you know, I mean, I'm sure he felt bad that he couldn't be a doctor. And, and you know, as far as I can tell, he did not make a life's, his life meaning in complaining that he couldn't be a doctor. And, you know, I knew a woman, I met her when she was in her 70s, and she had wanted to be a doctor. But almost the first thing she told me about herself when I met her was that she wanted to be a doctor, and she sort of implied that she would have been the best doctor on earth. But she couldn't be a doctor because she had children. And she told me this in front of her child. And you know, people start college in their late teens and 20s. So because I met her in her 70s, it meant that for 50 years of her life, she was feeling sorry for herself and complaining and telling everyone she met, this is likely the first story she told them, just like it was the first story she told me. Whoa. Talk about feeling sorry for yourself. So anyway, getting back to our hero, Vivian Thomas. So he lost his savings. He was cleaning dog kennels. He was cleaning the lab. But Dr. Blaylock was getting more and more responsibilities, both with his patients and also as a professor at the this is a university hospital. And he was looking for a young man he could train to do what he did 
as good as he did or better in the research there at the hospital. And Vivian Thomas was his man. And he taught Vivian Thomas how to be a very, very good surgeon. And Vivian Thomas basically took over most of Alfred Baylock's surgery, or a whole lot. Now they used to meet, they were like partners as far as the research part of Alfred Blaylock's work went. However, even though Vivian Thomas was now a laboratory technician and very respected, and eventually he was even teaching young doctors who are going through training in medical school how to do surgery, how to do the kind of surgeries he was doing, he, because he did not have a degree, was the only category they had for people who didn't have a degree at the hospital. There was janitor. And by now he was married. He had children. And it just wasn't enough money for him to care for his family. So after work, he was working as a handyman in the apartment complex where he lived. And on weekends during events, he was working as a bartender. Must have been exhausted. And at some point, and just in case you think that he was a person who was sort of, he took things laying down. He actually didn't. He went to Dr. Blaylock and he said, because Dr. Blaylock wanted him to do more and to spend more hours in the hospital. And Vivian Thomas said to him, look, I can't. Because to tell you the truth, I would be earning way more if I was working as a carpenter. And in fact, I'm thinking of going to be a carpenter because I have a family to care for. And Dr. Blaylock was so busy with all his research ideas and being a professor at the university and everything else, this is not stuff that he even thought about, but he went to bat for Vivian and he got him a nice raise so he could continue with the research. Now I'm coming to the last reason Vivian could have felt extremely sorry for himself. And it was, here is the book, Partners of the Heart. Can you see that? I'm trying to hold it so it doesn't. And this is Mos Def, who is playing Vivian Thomas. And this is Alan Rickman, who's playing Dr. Um, Alfred Blaylock. And so you can see that Vivian Thomas is a black man. He's an African descent, of African descent. And in the 1920s and 30s and 40s in the United States, that was a real drawback. And it was so bad that eventually they were doing their research at Johns Hopkins University, which is a very prestigious university research um, university hospital, research hospital. But their policy was that because he was African, he couldn't go in the front door. Even if he was walking in with his colleague, Dr. Blaylock, even if Dr. Blaylock said, he works for me, he is my colleague, I need him. The rules were that because he was black. He could not come in that front door. Now, I don't even know what it's like to be a black person in the United States, because I'm not. And I know that in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, it had to be a lot worse than it is now. Or anyway, I believe it was, because that was before desegregation. But he had a lot of reasons to feel really sorry for himself. But as far as I could tell, he just didn't want to waste his time and energy on it. He was so grateful to be doing the work he was doing. He loved the work he was doing. It was what he'd always wanted to do. And um, he thrived in that environment and received respect 
from Dr. Blaylock and many of the other doctors he worked with. Now, of course, there were some that didn't, but there were many that did respect him. All right, let's get to the dream. Now, this other doctor who is Dr. Tosic, she's a woman doctor, and in the movie, uh, Something the Lord Made, she is played by Mary Stewart Masterson. I don't know if you remember her. She was in Fried Green Tomatoes. She plays this part beautifully. And she's a cardiologist. So she's a woman who's a cardiologist. And she's dealing with these blue babies. And all that she does is care for them in the hospital until they die. And they all die, every single one of them. Some of them die very young. Some of them, you know, after a couple of years, they die. And she asked Dr. Blaylog what he, he had already solved the problem of shock, which so many soldiers in the war were dying from. And uh, with Vivian's help, Vivian helped him with that research. And then she said, would you help me with these children so they don't have to die. And he took, Dr. Blaylock took on that challenge. And I think I told you already that no one had done any operations on the heart before this time. And in fact, the rule was you did not touch the heart. But this is one part I love in the movie when Dr. Blaylock says, he said he had tuberculosis. And in, in those days, they didn't have the kind of medicine we have now. The way you cured tuberculosis was to be in a very cold place. So he was in upstate New York outside in a bed, in the outside in the winter with the snow and everything, with all these quilts piled on top of him because the cold, dry air would somehow cut the TB or it would help. And he said during that terrible time in his life when he was dying, he prayed to God and said, God, if you let me live, then I will do something worthwhile with my life. So he said, I'm taking this on these blue babies, I'm going to take this on and I'm going to operate on the heart. So then he and Vivian started figuring out what they were going to do. And they did research on the dogs. And everything after a while was going very well. And things looked good as if they'd be able to save all these children's lives. And they even had a operation with a little girl named Eileen Saxon scheduled because Dr. Tosik, the cardiologist, had told them that she was going to die soon if something wasn't done. So all this was set up. And then the dogs, the dog that had the operation that proved that this kind of operation would, would cure this problem, the dog died. They couldn't figure out what they'd done wrong. They did an autopsy. Dr. Blaylock in the movie says it's like a train wreck in there. And they just didn't know what it was. And this is when Vivian had the dream. And in the dream, he saw Eileen Saxon as a grown-up woman. And down below in the description, I um, have a, not only the link to the movie, but I also have a timestamp telling you just where that dream is. It's, it's done beautifully in the movie. And in the dream, she's a grown up, but she has the voice of a baby and she is knitting in the dream. And then she kills over dead. And in the dream, Vivian knows that her heart is only the size of a baby heart. Her heart, even though she's an adult, her heart has not grown to the size of an adult. And you know, our heart is about the size of our fist. So my heart is going to be about this big.
but a baby's fist is baby's going to have art only about that size. So, I mean, in the dream, the baby, the, this grown woman had a baby's heart. And he told the dream to Dr. Blaylock. He said, I don't know what this is about, but I got to tell you my dream. And this is an important thing to remember when you're interpreting dreams. You need to get the dream out of your subconscious mind and into your waking world. You can do it by writing the dream down. You can do it by talking to someone about the dream. <clears throat> and that's what Vivian did. And talking about the dream between the both of them, all of a sudden they had this, I know what it means. I know what's going on. And in my three-step creative dream interpretation checklist, that's what I talk about. You don't necessarily have to know what every symbol means in a dream. What you want is that aha when you get what it's about. And if I was interpreting their dream, one of the clues would be that Eileen Saxon was knitting, which means she was making stitches. And what they realized was that the stitches they use to suture, this, to stitch up the blood vessels had not grown as the dog had grown. They'd done the operation on the dog when he was 10 pounds and he died when he was 20 pounds. So they realized that the stitches hadn't grown with the dog. And right away, and I got to look at this because I'm not a doctor and I don't really know what it means. But right away, Dr. Blaylock says, I know how to solve this. Continuous on the back wall and interrupted on the front wall. And that's what he did. And it worked. Now, I'm just going to go on a little bit about the story because those of us who saw, remember I told you on the plane, you either saw the movie or you didn't see the movie. When the plane landed, the movie had ended and you could tell who had seen the movie because as we were waiting in the aisle for the door to open, you could see various people who had tears rolling down their faces and were crying. Some were sobbing. I, I was, had a lot of wetness on my face. And we knew right away that this was a person who'd seen the movie because it was a heart-rending movie. It, it just touched you so deeply. This, um, and we would wave to each other and, you know, smile and everything. Well, this is one of the places where you start to cry. And it is when they're doing the operation, the first ever operation on the heart. It was a bypass. And um, Dr. Blaylock realized he really needed Vivian's help. And even though Vivian wasn't a doctor, and even though the hospital administration was totally against it all, he got Vivian into the operating theater with him, got him suited up, had him stand on a stool by his right shoulder, and had Vivian talk him through the operation because Vivian knew how to do that operation way better than Dr. Blaylock did. And it turned out most of, many of the ensuing blueberry, blue baby operations in the future were done with Vivian Thomas standing on a stool by the right shoulder of Dr. Alfred Blaylock, talking him through it, saying, do you feel this? Do you feel that? So on this first operation with little Eileen Saxon, just a wee little thing on the operating table, you know, they've got a tent over her face where they're administering the anesthetic. So they put the cup over her face every once in a while. And um, the, uh, Vivian is asking Dr. Blaylock, do you feel the blood once he's finished stitching up the blood vessel doing the bypass? Do you feel the blood in the blood vessel? Do you feel it now moving through that blood vessel? And Dr. Blaylock says, it's so tiny. I, I, can, I can't feel anything. And then the people standing by the baby's head say, 
come on over here and take a look. And the little girl's face went from blue to pink. Oh my God, that was definitely tear time. So, you know, like I said, Vivian Thomas is a hero of mine. There's more details, more problems that he had. And I'm not going to go into them because what's important is the dream he had. And also what's important is that in the end, he couldn't get an MD, but he was given an honorary doctor of law at Johns Hopkins University. And he became the head of the laboratory and actually trained doctors in surgery. So, um, and the other really neat thing is that in the foyer of Johns Hopkins University, at the front door where he used to not be allowed to come in. They now had a painting of him next to Dr. Alfred Blaylock because he deserved that recognition. And of course, that's the end of the movie and that's when the tears just poured out of everybody's faces because he was such a decent human being, such an absolutely decent human being. And it really meant a lot to me, really meant a lot to me. And I hope you can see from what I'm telling you how very, very important interpreting dreams can be, how very worthwhile it can be. Now, you're not going to have a dream about operating on blue babies and saving their lives unless that's the work you do. You're going to have dreams about your life. Now, the dream might, and most dreams are just sort of rehashing what was going on the day before. But every once in a while, you have one of these amazing dreams that you could say came from God or somewhere, you know, it's just beyond your knowledge. This was something the doctors could not figure out. And it's the same with me, how I had the dream telling me about this stranger I'd never met, didn't know he existed, who's now been my husband. And this is another really important reason why it's so worthwhile to interpret your dreams. Now, I'm going to be doing my uh, next YouTube Live, and it's going to be about where do these special dreams come from. I'm going to talk about different types of dreams because there are different types of dreams, and I'm going to have my next YouTube Live on Thursday of this week, which is January 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I invite you to join me. And in the meanwhile, if you want to ask me a question for that session on February 26th, uh, not February, January January 26th, Thursday at 1 Eastern time. Um, just send me an email to carol at carolchapmanlive.com. And it won't, I will not interpret your dream, but if it's a question that applies to other people, general kind of question, I'll be glad to answer it. So um, thanks so much for... Uh, listening. Uh, here's the book. I, oh, I already showed you Partners of the Heart. And um, great talking with you. Toodaloo. Bye-bye.